Amen. As I mentioned this afternoon, we have our leaders meeting themed for the Global Leadership Conference. Right? Yes. It is 21 days away. It is coming up quick. I'm very excited about it. And this year, as we do every year with the Global Leadership Conference, there's a theme for the weekend, right? And this year's theme for the GLC is called Revolution. And the, what we're going to do is we're going to study the book of Acts at the GLC, studying the revolution of the first century church. It's incredible because the first century church really did change the world by disciples making disciples. God's church can change the world in the 21st century as well. Amen. God's church was always meant to be a revolution. But sadly, so many so-called Christians water down what God's church really is. Revolution is defined as a radical and pervasive change in society and social structure. The first century church was very pervasive. It was called a cult in the scriptures. It was called a sect. It was called a revolution that changed the world, and you either loved it or you hated the revolution. Today, the lesson title is simply, The Revolution. And we're going to look at some scripture here in the book of Acts, kind of getting us warmed up, ready for the Global Leadership Conference. As we get ready to study this book when we get there in Los Angeles, and we're going to talk about the revolution a little bit this morning. Turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 2. And as we study the, the first century church, God's church, the very early beginning of God's church starts in Acts chapter 2. This right here is at the Jewish festival of Pentecost. And the 11 faithful apostles, along with their other 12 now of Matthias, they're there and they're at Pentecost and all these thousands of Jews have come to Jerusalem from all over the known world to worship there in Jerusalem for Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes and gives them this incredible power to be able to preach in all these other different known languages that they've never studied before. And so everyone's hearing the message preached by Peter in their own native languages. And Peter gives a revolutionary message. To have a revolution, you need a revolutionary message. God's church has a revolutionary message. And Peter preaches in chapter 2, verse 22, this revolutionary message. He says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. And this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. He goes on and talks about the line of David and David's throne as king. And basically, what is he saying? He's saying, Jesus is from God. Your sins crucified him. But the good news is God raised him from the dead. He lives today. That's a revolutionary message. That there's a Messiah that is here to save you from our wicked lives. And not only can you be saved from it, you get an incredible gift on top of it. A gospel message like this, changing the eternity of men and women's souls, was a revolution. We deserve hell and death because of our sins and our rebellion against God. No one is righteous without God. Instead, Jesus takes our place on that cross. And then God raises him from the dead after dying that torturous death. And not only do we not have to pay that price of our sins, we get the grace and the gift of an undeserved heaven. On top of all of it. And a message like that will start a revolution. And it started a revolution there in the first century. That was the message. But not only do we have to have a message, we got to know what to do with that message. Peter goes on in verse 36 and he concludes the gospel sermon 
Right here at Pentecost, he says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. We must never forget the power of those two words. Jesus is Lord and Christ. What does that mean? He is Master and Savior. He's not just your Savior. He's your Master first. When you choose to make Him Lord, He then becomes your Savior. A lot of us just want the Savior without someone to obey. The religious world will teach you, just have Jesus as Messiah. Don't be super concerned about the obedience part. Just make sure you believe He's the Messiah. And we try to get through and bypass the Lord part and just get the Christ part. You can't have Jesus be Christ without him being Lord. So Jesus says, make sure you know he's Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the other apostles, well, brothers, what shall we do? They believe the gospel. They believe Jesus is the Messiah. They go, what do we do now? Peter says, great question. Repent and be baptized. Who? Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message. What was his message? Jesus is the Messiah. Those who accept that message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to the number that day. That's how God's church gets started. Peter preaches this message led by the Holy Spirit. They believe it. Well, at least about 3,000 believe it. And they go, what do we do now? He doesn't say, hey, just make sure you really believe it. He doesn't say, just repeat after me, you're a sinner, accept Jesus. He does not say that. He says, this is how you accept God's message. You repent, which is mean you stop willfully living in your sins. After you've made that decision, what is that? That's Jesus is Lord. And after you make that decision, then you accept the Christ part, which is then, then you choose to submit and be baptized so all your sins are forgiven. Through that faith in the saving waters of baptism, you contact Jesus' blood, you die to your sins, you come out resurrected to a new life, and you get the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter says, I promise you, this is for you and everyone else. Come on. And then he warns them. What does that mean? That means if you don't accept this. I'm warning you, if you don't accept this. You'll be stuck in this corrupt generation. And then he pleads with them. Accept the gospel. <laughs> Repent and be baptized. And those who accept this message make that decision to make Jesus Lord, to repent of their sins, and to be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. This is the message that started the revolution. This is the message that began and birthed God's church. Anything outside of that message is not the first century church that we see in the scriptures. The Bible is very clear on how to receive salvation. It is all through the scriptures, and it started right here in Acts chapter 2. If that seems fuzzy to you, or you seem kind of confused or irritated, you need to study the Bible. And you need to get some clarity on this. This is not something that you just go, oh, I'll, I'll think about it later. Or I'll just figure that out when I get to it. No, no, no. If this is, I'm warning you that you need to make sure you believe this. And I'm pleading with you to make that choice to study the Bible. Because it has huge implications. Huge implications. If you think you are right with God, when surely you're not. Amen. Let's make sure we believe the revolutionary message of God's church. Amen? Amen. What I want to also focus on is what Peter says to them in verse 40. He says, with many other words, he warned them, pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. The world was corrupt then. It's very corrupt today. The world is so lost. It's so hurting. And in a desperate need of the healing power of God. If you think about just the terror in our world. And the hate in our world. What comes to mind for me is 
the 49 people murdered in Orlando. And that's not an opinion matter of who they were or how they lived. The fact is they were murdered. The two men killed in our country by police officers in Minnesota and Louisiana. Murdering. And then, this past week, I myself was actually in Dallas, Fort Worth. I was there in Dallas on that Thursday night, working on my computer, doing some. I was visiting, I was asked to go visit the church there for a few days and help kind of solidify some things. And I'm working on my computer, working on the GLC stuff, figuring out who's going, all that stuff. My phone buzzes, CNN notification, three officers shot and killed in Dallas. I'm right there. It just shook me up there for a minute. I was like, oh my goodness. I'm here right now. The notifications keep piling in. Four officers shot and killed. Another five shot and killed. Three wounded. Seven wounded. Eleven wounded. And it shook me up. Come on, bro. But I think I want us to understand it. it's not just in America. I think we get very focused in our country here. And we forget that it's not just here, guys. We get focused on the racial hate here. And what we call hate crimes, you know, acting out in crimeful, which is totally wrong. But through racial hatred, whatever it may be, there's terror and crime everywhere, church. It's not just in America. Why? Because the evil is in man's heart. It's not a country. It's the world is lost. We live in a corrupt generation. The world is lost. It needs a savior. What do I mean by that? Just in ba Baghdad, 300 people killed by a bomb. Just this week, Istanbul, 40 people killed by a bomb at an airport, injuring over 230 people. It's July 10th. In the first nine days of July, there have been 57 incidents of attacks on people's lives. I'll say it again. In nine days, there have been 57 incidents of various attacks on people's lives. In nine days. We live in a very corrupt generation, church. The world is lost, and we used to be a part of that world. We used to be living in that darkness. But here's what I want us to walk away with, walking out of here, church, is we don't view these things politically. Come on, bro. Amen. This is going to be hard to talk about, guys. We don't view these things democratically, republicly, or Americanly, or foreignly. We view these things biblically. We let the Bible tell us what is right and wrong. And we obey the scriptures over our upbringings, over what our parents told us, over what we would learn and grew up to believe about certain people and races and whoever it is. We believe what the scriptures tell us. If we're a disciple, we are taught to obey the scriptures over our feelings, backgrounds, or whatever we came into the church with. Go to Romans chapter 13. I want us to walk out of here with a healthy, biblical view on these things. And you know what's incredible is that when you choose to submit to and accept the biblical stance on these issues, an overwhelming sense of peace will come over you. That you won't feel like you have to fight for your opinion to be heard anymore. You know that God's word is right and this is all that really matters. And when you choose to subscribe your heart to that... Let God speak for you. And you don't feel like you have to fight to try to make your opinion heard. Come on, bro. Opinions don't last that judgment day. God's word is all that matters. Let's make sure we walk out of here with a conviction on God's word. Romans 13, verse 1. It says, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except that which God has established. 
The authorities that exist have been established by God. And consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers, they hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right. He will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of your conscience. Yeah. That's why also you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to govern and give everyone to what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. I don't want to share with you my opinions today. Come on, bro. I'm going to challenge you to believe and obey the scriptures. Right. We must not have contempt for any governing authority. Amen. Come on, bro. Now, this, this might be a little weird coming from me in light of what has been happening. But if we're disciples, it doesn't matter. We must not have scorn and contempt and disrespect for any authority. Why? Because God let them be an authority. Right. Rebellion against an authority says you rebel against God. It does not say rebellion against unjust authority is righteous. Come on, bro. It just says rebellion against God instituted authority is rebellion against God. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning there is never, ever a condition in which rebelling against an authority is okay unless it is commanding you to disobey God. That is the only time. That is the only time. No person is ever justified for having contempt and open disrespect towards any authoritative government official. The Bible calls us not only to submit, but to respect those individuals. To respect them. Now, if an authority officer sins and acts unjustly and abuses his power, they will be held accountable to number one God. Yes. Keep that in mind. This is not our home. Yeah. Stop fighting. for This is not our home. Yep. They will be answerable to God in their conscience. Yeah. And then they will answer to the governing laws of the Lamb. We cannot have contempt and scorn for these authorities. Not every single government official, authority, police officer, whoever it is, military personnel, not every single one of them is corrupt and wants to inflict harm on individuals. We can't generalize an entire idea based off of specific instances. If we use that reasoning, church, and we start developing contempt and scorn and hate towards individuals, and we start hating the sinner, not the sin. We start treating people as their sins deserve and not just understanding that we need to hate sin and love the person. Yeah. And all sin is wrong no matter how it looks or however it comes out. Come but if we use the reason, we generalize that everyone is bad because they look like this person, that means every single person who opens the Bible and starts preaching that means they're corrupt because you've seen maybe one or two corrupt preachers. That means you're wasting your time here because that would mean that in that reasoning, I'm a corrupt preacher who's just stealing money and whatever our corrupt preachers do. I don't know. I can promise you I'm not a corrupt preacher. You've seen my apartment. You've seen how I live. Not living the big life. You see my car. But you know what I mean. What I'm saying, if we take and say, well, if this officer did that, that means all these officers are corrupt. It's, a, it's an immature reasoning. It's not a biblical reasoning. Sin is sin. Sin will be punished by God, either through Jesus on the cross or in hell. The sins they commit will be punished through Jesus on the cross or in hell, and they take their own responsibility. These events must not create scorn and hate in our hearts. Instead, church, I want to challenge you to rise above. Church, I want to challenge you that these events 
need to create a brokenness in your hearts. A deep compassion in your hearts. We need to make sure there's no prejudice in our church. We need to make sure we don't view anyone with a jaded view. No matter where they come from, what color they are, or what they know, or what their background is. We will not tolerate any prejudice in this church. This is God's church, and it's all nations. What I want to challenge us to do, church, is not do what the world does and spew our venom and opinions and hatred. I want to challenge you to get broken. Get broken about these things. Martin Luther King Jr. says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And if you see our banner for the Global Leadership Conference, the theme of it is called revolution, right? Bringing a revolution to the nations. And look at the little theme there on the word revolution. Love. Only love can ever change the world in a revolution. Having more hate, more scorn, will not change anything. Only love can have a revolution. Thanks, bro. What I want to challenge us to do, church, is you need to get anguish in your hearts. You need to feel anguish in your hearts. You might be upset about these things. How do you think God feels? How do you think God feels when he sees his children killing each other? How does that make him feel? When it happened that Thursday night when I was in Dallas, I couldn't sleep that night. I, I barely slept. I had a hard time going to bed. The next morning I got up, had my prayer walk out there for an hour. It was hard to pray. There, there were tears as I was praying, just thinking about the brokenness of this world. Yeah. Just thinking about the hatred man has towards man. Yeah. It, 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 was, it was hard to pray. And that's where I want us to evaluate our hearts, church, to not be filled with hate but love. I want to talk about having anguish. Whatever happened to having anguish in God's church? Anguish about the world. It's a word we do not hear anymore in this pampered society we live in. Yeah. What is anguish? It's extreme pain and distress. The emotions so stirred that it becomes painful. Deeply felt inner pain because of conditions about you, in you, or around you. Anguish, deep pain, deep sorrow, the agony of God's heart. We say we want to save the world, but we have become so passive in our hearts. Really, all true passion is born out of the anguish in our hearts. If you search the scriptures, you will find that whenever God wanted to recover and restore a ruined situation... He would go and share his anguish and his heart for what he saw happening to his people. And then he would find a praying man. And he would take that man and literally baptize him in God's anguish. And have him feel what God feels. You find that in Nehemiah chapter 1. Turn with me to Nehemiah 1. And in Nehemiah 1, verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. 
Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, that we've committed against you. We've acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Nehemiah was in anguish because of the ruins of Jerusalem. He felt this deep pain in his heart. So how is God going to deal with this? How is he going to deal with ruined Jerusalem? How will he restore it? God found a man who would not just have a flash of emotion that would eventually just be a sudden burst of just concern and then die out. Okay. Nehemiah Church was not a preacher. This was a career man. But this was a praying man that God took and filled his heart with anguish. Nehemiah said, no, I broke down and I wept. I mourned and I fasted. And then I began to pray night and day. Why didn't any other men have any other answers besides Nehemiah? Why didn't God use them in the restoration of Jerusalem? They didn't have a word of prayer. There was no anguish in their hearts. They did not have God's heart. There was no weeping. There was no despair in their hearts about how Jerusalem had gotten. Does it matter to you today, church? Does it bother you that the world is coming into the church, God's Jerusalem, and impacting the church rather than the church impacting the world? Does that bother you? Does that bring you pain in your heart that God's church is being influenced by the world instead of the church influencing the world? The music coming in, stealing the purity of God's church. The entertainment business coming in, stealing the heart of God's church. An obsession with entertainment and pleasure. A hatred for correction and rebuke. A hatred for discipline and hard work. Nobody wants to hear it anymore. They want an easy, complacent life. And we let the church be influenced by the worldliness and the evil of the generation that we live in. Where is your anguish over the brokenness of God's church? I don't want to hear your hatred about what has happened. Are you broken? Are you moved by how lost these people are? Do you have pain in your heart, not just for your race, but for their souls? Do you have pain over how lost these people are? And how much they need love? Do you have anguish over the prostitution you see? Do you have anguish over the pornography industry? Do you have deep pain over the millions of babies aborted every year in this country? Deep pain over human trafficking, over drug abuse, over adultery, destroying families, the divorces we see, children with no fathers, teen pregnancies, sexual abuse, rape, and suicides. The land is more and more cold than ever. Does it stir your heart, church? Does it bring you pain when you think about it? More closely, what about the Jerusalem in your heart? The walls of that Jerusalem, are they in ruins? Being blind to the lukewarmness that creeps into God's church. Being blind to the sin that creeps into our hearts. That's what the devil wants, church. He wants to slowly drain any spiritual power and passion. He wants to take the fight out of you and just kill it. So you just sit around and do nothing about it. So you can sit and watch television for hours and watch those around you burn in hell. That's what he wants. 
He doesn't want you to feel the pain. He doesn't want you to know what's happening. He wants you to get caught up in opinions and racism and not do anything about it and have hate for these people and only create more hate. He wants to take the fight out of us, church. There's a difference between having anguish and then being concerned. Concern is just something interests you. You take interest in a project or a cause or a need, but that's not anguish. If our hearts are not born in anguish, where when you saw and what you heard of that ruin, it drove you to your knees in prayer, took you to a baptism of anguish of your heart, where you began to pray and to seek God, until we are in anguish and agony over these things, it will simply die whatever you try to do. It won't work. There'll be no renewal, no awakening, no revival until we let God once again break us. Let him break your heart and feel what he feels. Are we deep in prayer as a church? Why is it so hard for Christians just to pray? Why is it so hard for us just to pray to God? A true prayer life begins in a place of anguish. You're disgusted with what you see around you. you and once you set your heart to pray, God comes and he starts to share his heart with you. And you'll begin to feel what God feels. And then you'll begin to do what God wants you to do. Your heart begins to cry out, God, your name is being blasphemed by people. Your truth is being perverted. Your church is tolerating lukewarmness and something has to be done. Don't tell me you're concerned when you spend hours in front of television and the internet. You are not concerned. Do not tell me you're concerned about the lost world when you sleep as much as you want to. When you don't work and provide for your families and you don't work and you don't have discipline to do what you need you to do. You're not concerned. Some of us need to confess today. Some of us need to confess and say, I know I'm not where I know I should be. I don't have your heart, God. I don't share your burden of the lost world. I've just wanted it easy. I've been searching for comfortability and happiness. Some of us need to get open today with where we've been. But understand that your true joy and happiness, it comes out of anguish. There's nothing of the flesh that will give you joy. There is no physical thing. I don't care how much money, what kind of a house, what kind of a car, however big your bank account is, it will not give you joy. Amen. Nothing physical will give you joy. True joy comes when you obey God and you share his heart. When you have the heart of God and you obey his commands, then you truly are happy. I want to call the men out of the church this morning. Where are the men who have God's heart? Like Nehemiah, who weep and pray over the sins they see in this world. The men who have honor. The men who stand up and say, I feel God's heart. I'll do something about it. I'll stop living for myself. I'll devote myself to giving my life to the ministry because my family is dying. Where are the men who have integrity in the church who are going to stand up and do what's right and stop being dragged to just love God? Where are the men who are going to stand up and lead their families who will stand up with a heart of anguish and know that they are not what they need to be with God? And that we can be called to greatness. Where are the men who are going to stop living like boys in this church? And stop hating discipline. And stop hating correction. And stop hating challenges. And stop running when things get tough. Lead your families. Lead this church. Get anguished, men. 
Start feeling the burden God feels. Have integrity to do what God calls us to do. That's why we stay up late. That's why I wake up early. That's why we give everything we've got. My heart has anguish for how broken this world is. That's why we give special missions, church. When you don't want to give, you don't have God's heart. Because if there was something you could do in our rich, comfortable America, if you had God's heart, you would do it. We don't want to give the special missions because we're selfish and we want to do everything we can to preserve our comfortable American life. And you can't stand the thought of sacrificing comfort to help someone else. It's time to repent, church. If you don't have a heart to give, that's why we go to Los Angeles for the GLC. That's why we pour ourselves out. Church, it's time to build the walls of Jerusalem in your families. The walls of Jerusalem in your own heart. Make yourself unmoved by the enemy. And be filled with God's heart. Share the agony that God has. Turn to Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, verse 41. And we see Jesus shared the same heart that Nehemiah felt for Jerusalem. In verse 41, as he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city. He wept over it. Church, I need you to understand what weeping means. That's not a, a sniffle. That's not a... Oh, wow, it's, it's really sad. Jesus, the Son of God, was sobbing because of the spiritual state of Israel. He was weeping, and he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day, what would bring you peace? But now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and circle you and hem you on every side. They'll dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Church, our time is short. We don't have a, a lot of time to revolutionize the world with God's love. Our time is short. It's time to fall down and weep Amen. over how lost our world is and forsake our opinions and start sharing God's heart. So what is Jesus' plan? For a lost Jerusalem, for a lost world? Well, if you look under your chairs, his plan is to save the world through world evangelism. And you see that scripture there at the top. But you'll receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus' plan is to get to all ends of the earth. And to bring God's revolution of love. God's church was always intended to reach all nations in a generation. The idea of a local community church that has no interest or plan to save the world is not the church of the Bible. Community church that just wants to hang out and not change the world is not the church of the scriptures. What we have is a simple plan, yet extremely challenging plan. It's a plan by Jesus. He says, go Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. And what's incredible is we have a plan as a fellowship of churches to get to the ends of the earth. Because we know our time is short, and we know that the world is lost. If this isn't the first time you've seen that piece of paper, so if you're familiar with this piece of paper, do you pray through these things? If you know this, do you get irritated every time I print this out? Do you get upset and you don't even care to look at the piece of paper? 
Because you're not super concerned about changing the world. You, you're just trying to have a comfortable life. I challenge you today to change your heart. Believe in Jesus' dream. Get a heart like Jesus does. Fill our hearts with compassion for the lost world. Guys, the challenge today is simple. Don't be deceived by the devil's schemes. Do not let any prejudice and hate towards each other creep into our family. Do not take opinionated stances on these things and the horrible things that have happened in our world. But to walk out of here with biblical conviction and to walk out of here with a desire to change the world and to fill our hearts with anguish so we can change the world and bring that revolution to all nations. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you so much. That's the lesson.